In this second part of our 2014 entry draft preview, we look at the Flames' second and third round picks, picks 34, 54, 64, and 83, and the players that the Flames might take at those picks. This is Fireside Chat, episode 48, rounds 2 and 3, recorded June 7th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back. We're in the middle of our draft preview episodes. And in our last episode, we talked about the top five players and who we'd like to see the Flames take fourth overall. This episode, we're going to be featuring the second and third round picks the Flames have. And as usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt. How you doing, Matt? Awesome as always. So as we're recording this on uh, June 7th, we're right in the middle of the Stanley Cup Finals. What's your thought? Who do you think is going to become our 2014 Stanley Cup champion? Uh, the Cup should remain in the Western Conference with the LA Kings. I think they'll win it in either 5 or 6. I don't think that New York quite has enough talent to be as much of a threat like Chicago or San Jose were, so... Yeah, I think the Rangers have been our Cinderella team this year. They've got some talent, but I don't think they're nearly as deep as um, L.A. is, and I don't think that just their goaltender is going to be enough to win them the Cup. No. Like, Lundqvist, in my eyes, is a lot better than Quick, but he's not enough better to make a difference by himself. And I know a lot of people disagree with me. I've always been a fan of Daryl Sutter, the coach. Daryl Sutter, the GM, is another story, but I've always been a fan of Daryl Sutter, the coach, and I'd like to see him get a cup. Yeah, and I'd like to see Regeer get his name on there as well, so. Yeah. So we'll see how this how this turns out. The Stanley Cup Finals may or may not be over by the time this episode gets out, depending on how many games we go, but yeah, I agree with you. I think that we're going to see the Kings in five or six on this one. Well, we're going to look today at the second and third round uh, players for the Flames. And the Flames have four picks in those two rounds. Um, You've been doing a lot of analysis on prospects, Matt. What's your overall thoughts and opinions on the prospect pool between kind of 60 and 90? Well, from 30 right through, uh, there's a lot of good forwards. But uh, like you can see that they have holes in their game. And, you know, like, there's just something that's not there that, you know, like, you would see in an impact forward that would be going in the first round. Like, either they don't pass it too well or their shot's not quite effective, this, that, or whatever. But one really good thing is that the caliber of defensemen in this draft is excellent. And there's quite a few right-handed shooting defensemen on top of it. So, you know, it for a team like ours that has very little defensive depth, this is like the perfect draft for us to have four picks in the top 60 or top 90 because uh, there are a wide range of players to choose from that would definitely fulfill what we were looking for to fill the holes in our defense core. So it's all good. Yeah, you you mentioned a lot of these players have you know some holes in their game. And I think any year, if you were to look back historically, where you have such a dynamic first-round group as we do this year. I mean, we talked about the top five North American skaters. There's some really good European skaters in there. I think after a a top end talent group like that, you are going to be left with kind of the leftovers. And I think we have more top end players than we do this year than we do most years. So I think that's probably a natural thing to have. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like it, magically the talent dries up at like say 25. Like there are players that we could hypothetically pick in the third round that are very talented this draft is a little weird in that there's not like a clear section from like say 20 to 40 that is like the second tier and then you know from 41 on is like the third tier there's no real 
the vibe it's just there. Just kind of a big lump of players. Yeah. It it's like uh, in the last episode, like where we're picking, where like there are different flavors of players and like which te- one fits your team the best. That's kind of what the second and third round are like. It just depends on what you're looking for because there's a lot of everything. So, you know, it just depends on what everybody else does. Mm -hmm. But there should be very good players available at all of our picks, so that's good too. Well, let's profile some of those players. So the Flames have their one pick in the first round, which is number four, and then we'll see them up at the podium again at number 34, the fourth pick in the second round. Um, that's their that's their pick. That's not a pick they've traded for. And you've identified kind of three players you think they might pick there. Uh, two of them are defensemen. As you said, the defensive group is strong this year. So why don't we start off with the first defenseman on that list, which is Travis Sanheim. And he he played in the WHL this year. He had uh, 67 games played, 5 goals, 24 assists for 29 total points. Um, 6 foot 4, two, 216 for a defenseman. What are your thoughts on, on Sanheim? Uh, he's very similar to the player that TJ Brody was at age 19. So, like, when he was starting to figure out how to play defense properly, but not quite there yet. He is a very good offensive defenseman, and he's very good skating, very good passing. His slap shot is kind of not... He he won't score 10 goals in the NHL with it, likely, but, you know, he has a, a good overall offensive game. He'd be the type of guy that you'd like to have as, like, the playmaker on the power play for the between the defense pairing to set up the guy who has the rocket shot, like Weidman or Russell. So, you know, it, it, he's an overall good defenseman, and anytime you can get a good skating defenseman that's six foot four, that's not bad. And, you know, you mentioned he's not, you know, the best defensive, uh, offensive defenseman. I don't think every defenseman has to have a huge offensive upside. You do need guys that are more defensive uh, defensemen, too. So I think it's perfectly fine if he doesn't end up being, you know, a, a really good defenseman with a really good slap shot. Yeah. Well, if, like, everything pans out, he could likely put 30-plus points on the board as a defenseman. Because he does have a very good outlet pass and all the... He looks very similar to what TJ Brody did back when he was 19-ish. So, you know, competent offensively, for sure. And Sanheim is a guy that a lot of Calgary fans will be familiar with. He's played for the Hitmen, uh, so we've had a good look at him. I'm sure the Flames... Uh, Brass has had a good look at him there as well. He's been around the Dome. They probably know more about this kid off the ice than they would a lot of guys just because he's around, they're seeing him, that sort of thing. And he's actually ranked right now 30th overall um, by the Central Scouting. So, yeah, I think if he were to fall to 34, that would probably be very reasonable. Yeah, it's one of those things that, especially when you get into the 20s and 30s in the draft, that you can pretty much throw the rankings out out the window because, like, if you look even at our second first-rounder last year, Poirier, like, he was ranked in, like, the mid-50s, and yet he went 22nd overall. So, like, all that needs to happen is a couple of times where someone that's a little further down gets picked and, you know, he could slide to us. So, you know, it's not out of the realm of impossibility there. It sure not. Um, as far as the the negatives about this kid or things that we need to worry about, what have you flagged with that we should be looking out for? He's not the best in his own end. Like it, it, he's more of an offensive slanted defenseman, but he's not terrible in his own end either. It, he. He's not going to step in anytime soon. Like he's probably going to be a two to three year wait before 
he even looks at cracking the NHL. But, you know, again, anytime you get a six foot four defenseman that's competent offensively, you know, that's pretty valuable because if you can learn the defensive end, you got a good top three defenseman there, so. Well, another player that you flagged who might be available and you'd like to see the Flames take with that 34th pick is uh, a winger, right winger, Jakob Vrana, who's played in uh, who's played in Europe. He's fourth on the European Central Scouting list this year. He's a winger that's six foot, 176 pounds. Um, you've identified him as a quality two-way player. What should we know about this guy? Well, it, he is the type of guy that Detroit picks in the second or round or beyond, waits three, four years, and, oh, there's your top six all-star caliber forward. You know, he is very good at, in his own end. He's very good on the penalty kill, yet he's also very good offensively. When I was doing my previews, he was uh, it was before the under eighteen tournament, and you know, like he was ranked to go around fiftieth or so um, from a couple of different sources. But then he ended up scoring like nine goals in the tournament and is rocketed up, so he might be a late first rounder now, but. You know, and I actually wouldn't be shocked if Detroit used their first rounder on him because he's like that prototypical, like Thomas uh, Tatar or Yurko or Nyquist or any of their other finds where you're going, how did you get these guys? So, you know, that's... So potentially a diamond in the rough player there who if, yeah. he, if he's on the board, you probably have to give serious consideration of taking him. Yeah, it normally, you know, because of our depth up front, normally I would, you know, slant towards a defenseman, but, you know, he's just very good at both ends of the ice. He's just a little raw, and he'll take a couple of years to put everything together, but if you got all the tools in the toolbox and all you need is time, that's, you know, where you get your... TJ Brody type home run picks in the later rounds. So, you know, it I would take a flyer on him if he was on the board and, you know, Sanheim wasn't. So, and I think for the Flames in their current state, they have 3 or 4 years that would be required to develop them. They don't need these guys to be ready this year or next year. They have that kind of development time if that's what it's going to take. Mhm. Do you think it would be safe to say that if he is on the board, he would not be by 54th. If you want him, you have to take him 34th. Yeah, I there's a few teams that are starting to pick in Detroit's fashion. And, you know, he, I honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if Vrana did go first, to, first round whatever Detroit's picking at because he is just that guy for them. <laughs> But, you know, uh, if he's on the board at 34, he will not make it past... I don't even think he hits 40. I think that's an interesting thing to kind of think about, too, is that we are picking 34. So, really, we'll kind of get... I know it's a bad way to say it, but the leftovers in the first round. Like, if there is a guy who is ranked in the top 30 and falls out of top 30 for whatever reason, we can swoop in and get that guy potentially four picks removed from the first round. So... Yeah, there still might be some really good talent available there. Oh, yeah, and you just never know exactly what's on the board until you get there because you might get a guy like, say, Nicholas Goldobin, who's a Russian forward. He might slide because he's a Russian, and yet, like, if he was, say, Canadian or Swedish or whatever, he'd probably be a top 12, top 15 pick. So you don't know and like do you take a risk on that you know but you don't know until you're getting ready to go up to pick so it depends <laughs> that's the problem with trying to extrapolate the guys in the second and third round and beyond because you just don't know what the other 29 teams are up to <laughs> 
exactly. And and yeah, you won't know as you said until you get there, um, and you see who is on the board there. But yeah, I think you know another right winger, another forward in the system can never hurt either. Um, and as you said, the second round is full of good defensemen. And that brings us to another guy you identified who you might like to see the Flames take, and that's defenseman Jack Glover. He was in the U.S. Development Program, the under-18 U.S. Development Program last year, ranked 38th overall by Central Scouting. Um, six foot three, 192 defensemen. What should we know both pros and cons of Glover? Um, well, he's another tall defenseman. He's, again, more of an offensive defenseman. Uh, he's a right-handed shot, and he's got a good shot at that. The, the main drawback with him is that he's going to need to four years in the NCAA to fulfill what he needs. But typically with defensemen, I always, like, if they're big, that's good, but if they're big plus they're fast then like that's like an added bonus because if you can teach them how to play if they have deficiencies in their game then like you've got a 6364 or bigger guy that's good at both ends that kind of thing so you know plus speed always helps when you do make a mistake to cover that up and Glover he is quick has a good shot, good offensive instincts. Yeah, it, I wouldn't expect him until At his 2018. his size, it seems like he's going to need some time to fill out, too. Yeah, because, like, I'm also 6'3", and, you know, like, if I was in, like, athletic weight, like, I'd probably be 230. So if he's, you know, he's only, like, 190 right now, so that'll take him some time to fill out. <laughs> If Jay Feaster was still the GM here, knowing that this guy is uh, an NCAA player, I'd say he's probably a shoe-in to be taken by the Flames. Jay Feaster loved to draft his U.S. college players. Um, I think, though, you know, the Flames, again, as we talked about earlier, I think the Flames have the time to give this guy four years in the NCAA if that's what it's going to take. What do you think? Yeah, and the thing is, is that a lot of the notable defensemen like Jack Doherty and a few others that are in this ballpark that are also good they're all a lot of them are going to the NCAA so you know either way you're gonna have to wait so it you know and really we're in no rush you know we're the NHL Flames are not likely going to be in the playoff hunt for another two seasons. So, you know, more than enough time to wait. <laughs> well, and even if they were in the playoff hunt in the two in two seasons, you don't want to have all your young players on the team at that point either. You still need to be cycling these guys through. So if he were to be ready in four years after NCAA, plus they need a year of AHL development, I think that, you know, that cycle is very natural. And he might be a guy that we see as a younger talent who joins the team in five years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's all good. You know, it, it, the Flames need a lot of everything, especially on defense. So if you get somebody from the WHL or whatever, or the NCAA, it doesn't matter because we can use quick or developing guys. We can use more projects. It depends you know <laughs> it's all good though either way <laughs> so matt if you were going to the podium for the flames for the 34th overall pick of those three gentlemen who would you take uh, it's really tough i personally like forwards a little better and even though we're we're really skilled have a lot of skilled forwards, I would probably take Vrana just because I do like his upside as a two-way right winger. But, you know, it, it you'd be splitting hairs between him and Sandheim, though. Like, it, it's really close. Can you see the Flames take Sandheim if there's a, a question in their mind just for the fact that he's a hitman? Uh, I... I could, and, you know, 
I'd be happy, I'd be thrilled if we got Sanheim. So, you know, I'd be happy with any of the three, really, so... Having the limited knowledge I do of the three and that I've actually seen Sanheim play for the Hitmen, I think I'd probably go with Sanheim if he's available at 34. Yeah. I It's one of those, you know, you got two players that are both really good and like, oh, gee, which one do I want? The really good one that plays defense or the really good one that's a forward. So, you know... <laughs> Yeah, and, and, you know, the Flames may have, we don't know internally, they may have a quota of what they want to get forwards to defensemen or something like that. So being that this is only the second pick um, that they're going to be having, I think you could go either way. Yeah, like there's no exact formula, so it's all up in the air until you get closer to when you're actually going up there to pick again. The Flames are lucky enough that they actually have another pick in the second round. They're going to pick 27th overall as well, and or not 27th overall, but the 27th pick in the second round, 57, 54th overall. And they acquired that pick on trade deadline day when we traded Rito Barra to the Avalanche. So we get yet another chance to jump in on the top 60 players. And you've identified six players who you think might go at the 54th overall spot. Um... It looks like you've split them fairly evenly between wingers. Uh, we have a right winger, a centerman, two defense, a goalie, and a left winger. So a little bit of everything available at that position, it looks like. Um, why don't we talk first about the first guy on your list, which is Nick Magyar? Yeah. Is that how you say his name? Yes. He played with the Kitchener Rangers. Nick Magyar of the Kitchener Rangers. And he is a uh, he's a right winger, so another winger. And we talked about the winger who is available at the at the thirty fourth pick. What do we know about Magyar? Uh he was like uh Monaghan last year where he was the best player on a crap team. And he had the most points. He only had forty six points, which usually for a second round pick is like about twenty points low. But yeah, the only other good players on that uh, team were Ryan McKinnis and uh, Darby Llewellyn. So, you know, it, if you're not playing with good players, it, you know, it's hard to generate any offense. Like, they were the worst team in the OHL by a mile. Like, they were, like, Buffalo Sabres territory bad. <laughs> so that's always going to hurt your stats, too. So if you're looking just purely stats-wise, that's yeah. going to be why his stats are a lot lower. Yeah, and that's why I think he, even though he he might fall to 54, if you were just basing it off of skill and talent, though, like, he could go in the first round. Like, he's not a bad player. It's just the circumstances surrounding him. He's very much uh, a player that gives a good second effort, knows where he needs to go in the offensive zone, has a good shot, good passing ability. Everything that you would need from a forward, it's just he played on a dreadful team. So, you know, if we can snag him at 54... That would be a win, just because he is that much better than a lot of the other potential forwards. So, where do you know where he's ranked right now by Central Scouting? I uh, I've seen him ranked like all over the map. Like I've seen him in some places ranked into the third round, some in the late first. He's really all over the map. So, you know. And that's usually what happens with those players that are a good player on a crappy team because it's all a question of, well, does this kid have it or is he just the best of the worst? Yeah, exactly. And from what I've seen of him, he he looks like he actually has something there and is not just the shiny object on the bad team. And I think, you know, it might be a little bit early in the second round to be kind of picking guys who you're not sure if they're going to make it or not. So I think you might see teams stray away from him in the second round and a player like that may end up falling to the third or fourth round. Yeah, it, well, put it this way, if he's available at 64, I don't care who else is on the board, take him. 
because <laughs> you're getting a very good value for a third rounder. But, you know. The next guy you had down here on our list is uh, Brett Pollock, a centerman. Uh, he played with Edmonton this past year in the WHL. He had 25 goals, 30 assists for 55 points overall in the regular season, 19 points in the playoffs. He's 6'2", 183 pounds. What makes Pollock special? Uh, he's like Monaghan light. He's good at a lot of things, but not exceptional. And he's like a tier below Monaghan or two. But, you know, he's proficient in a lot of areas, but not exceptional in any of them, if that makes sense. It, he, you're looking at a guy that, like, if he develops, is more of a second, third line center. Which you're expecting out of a second, a late second round pick. Yeah, he he wouldn't be a bad pick. Honestly, if I was picking, I'd go defense just because there's nothing like exceptional about him to make you go, oh, I gotta have this player here. But you know. If the Flames weren't as deep defense or on in our forward group, like I'd be all for him. It's just when you got guys like Backlund, Granlund, Jankowski, Knight, and so on and so forth, you don't need another of the same. You know, vary it up a bit. Get a defenseman or a right winger where you're lacking. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, you know, again, I think it might be attractive to take a player who's playing in Alberta because it's easy for his scouts to see him and stuff. But I agree with you. The Flames have a lot of young forwards right now. And I think that even if you're taking best available, I think there's probably other guys out there who you could say, yeah, he can fill some holes or perhaps best available by position, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, my view on it is, like, unless the guy has something that, as a forward, that's out of the norm like Vrana's really good both defensively and offensively and Magyar seems to have more talent than what else is available at 54 you know like that you need that because if you're just going for someone that's average like we already got that covered already (laughs) so and and, well and average is easy to pick up too I mean you know, if you look at what the Flames had for walk-on free agents this year at training camp, you can find average fairly easily. Exactly. So, you know, you need exceptional. You need to have guys that See, have the tools to be a first-line guy or a second-line guy. Something special there. <laughs> so you were mentioning uh, something special, someone exceptional, and you mentioned you'd pick a defenseman. That brings us to Aaron Hayden. He's a defenseman who's played in the OHL this year. He had 16 points in the regular season and none in the playoffs. He's 6'3", 190 pounds. Aaron Hayden is a defenseman. Would you take him, Belleville Bulls? Uh, If he's available at 54 or if he's available at 64, I'd take him either way. He is Patrick Seeloff, but he's 6'4", where Seeloff's only 6'0". He hits everything, he fights, he is truculence personified. He is... And the thing is, is that he's also very quick on his feet. So, you know, not only can he hit, but, you know, he can get... Play defense good defensively because of his speed. So, you know, if you're wanting someone to beat up the other team, Hayden's your guy. Well, if he's Trucklands personified, we know that Berkey's going to want to take him. Yeah. Put it this way, uh, of all these players that in the second and third rounds that uh, I we're going to be reviewing, this is the one guy that's number one on my list that I will pretty much guarantee you is top three in the Flames because he is just exactly what Burke wants <laughs> and what we need. What do you think the chance that Aaron Hayden would still be on the board when the Flames get up to make the 54th pick would be? Uh, Fairly good, just due to the fact that his offensive game is lacking severely, and 
typically in the second round, usually the defensemen that are taken, they want guys that have offensive skill. So, you know, because usually if you're taking a defenseman, you're usually lacking in offensive skill from the back end. So, but, you know, the Flames have that already it, with guys like Kulak and Culkin and Watherspoon to an extent. So, you know, but they do need big physical defensemen that are able to project to be quality NHL players, and Hayden is the best of the bunch in that regard. So if you're speaking so highly of Hayden Fleury, why would you draft him below somebody like a Sanheim or a Glover? Why would you not use your 34th pick to take Hayden if he's still on the board? Is it just confidence that he'll be available at 54? Uh, It's mainly due to the fact that he... Sandheim at, or Glover or a few of the others, they have some of the same characteristics, but like they're just better, like overall as a defenseman, because like they might have the offense, but they or the defense, but they also have the offense. Where Hayden's pretty much an all defensive smash guy, <laughs> so you know it. Your his upside is more of a Corey Sarich, Robin Regeer ish light. Okay, well that, that's good to know. Um, I haven't seen a lot of Hayden or Aaron Hayden, but when you posted your article on the site, I got quite intrigued by him. So I actually went out and took a look, um, tried to find some more information on him, and I'm liking. I'm not. I haven't seen a whole lot, but I'm liking what I see so far. Uh, Hayden. Sounds like a pretty compelling option, but another one that we might consider is Josh Joshua Jacobs. He played in the USHL. He has 23 points, uh, 5 goals, 18 assists, and no points in the playoffs this year. Ranked 43rd overall on the central scouting list. He's six foot two, 194 pounds. What makes Josh Jacobs special, Matt? Uh, he is another big right-handed shooting defenseman, and... Uh, just like Glover, he's expected to go to the NCAA for three, four years. And they're somewhat similar. Uh, for me, it's just personal preference. I'd prefer Glover to Jacobs, but you're splitting hairs. They're more or less the same guy. So, you know. It, so if you miss out on one, you think you could grab the other? Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it's a toss-up. Either way, you're getting, like, a same level and potential of guy, so, which is good, so. How they turn out will be a toss-up, but, you know, it's all good. If you're the Flames scouting staff and you're sitting with the 54th pick overall and you, had, you want to take a defenseman, you have Aaron Hayden and Josh Jacobs. Which one do you take? Hey, uh, it would depend on what other teams are kind of indicating from, like, if you think that Hayden's going to be gone between 54 and 64, then take Hayden, even though Jacobs is slightly better because he has an offensive game to him. But, you know, if Hayden, you think, can slide to 64, then go with Jacobs because... He does have an offensive game, so, you know, and that's better. Because, you know, you can always get, like, a Corey Sarich type from UFA or whatever, so. You know, uh, but getting, like, a true offensive defenseman, like, those are a little harder to get, so. Makes sense. Yeah. Like, that's the only reason, like, why I would take Sandheim or Glover over... Hayden, even though, like, Hayden's probably the best defensive defenseman, just because of value if they turn out. Now, the article you wrote on our website, you said that one of the cons to taking Jacobs would be that he's likely going to go to the NCAA. Why do you see that as a con in a player who's taken so late in the draft? Uh, it's more that, like, you're going to have to wait, and, like, 
you know, on CP, a lot of people jump all over Jankowski for not being, like, super amazing in the NCAA, and, like, they're very impatient with them. And, like, I just don't know if people, like, if you got this guy that's supposed to be, like, your top, one of your top picks from this year, you know, like, I don't know if they'll have the patience to wait three or four years to see that player actually emerge. You know what I mean? But at the same time, he's been taken 54th overall. He's not going to be a guy that's going to be in the spotlight for Flames fans. I think your 4th overall and your 34th overall guy will be the ones that do that. I think Jankowski, who was drafted in the first round, that's reasonable to expect. True. It's just, you know... Yeah. I mean, people weren't saying that about Bill Arnold. Yeah, well, that's different because he was a fourth rounder. So, you know, it just, you know, don't want people flipping out if he's not amazing right away. That's all. That was why I was saying, like, that is a bit of a con just because people seem to want, like, a more immediate impact, like, you look at, say, like, Granlund, he stepped in relatively quick. Watherspoon, you know, we just picked him in 2011. Both of them played in the NHL. Uh, Seeloff, he would have, if he didn't have his infection, he probably would have got a few games as well. You know, and then you got Poirier and Klimchuk, who are both looking very good and looking to make an immediate impact as well, like... Flames fans seem to want more of an immediate thing, so that's why you can wait okay. on guys like Gaudreau and Arnold and Agostino and that, because, you know, they're project projects where, you know, guys like Glover and Jacobs aren't quite as much of a project. Just gotta that makes wait. Sense. <laughs> yeah. So as far as the 54th overall pick uh, and your choices for who you'd pick there, that's the end of the defenseman. But you also brought up the prospect of the Flames picking a goaltender with that pick, and that's Mason McDonald, who played for Charlatan of the QMJHL. Um, the Flames are, I think we can probably say definitively, short on goaltending prospect in the system right now. We have some good talent, but we don't have a lot of them. Um, Mason is second in the Central Scouting North American goalie list. He's six foot four, 185 pounds. What do we need to know about this goaltender? Uh, if you've watched Cam Ward play for the Carolina Hurricanes, you're basically getting the prospect version of that, where he relies solely on positioning and making sure that he is in the right position all the time. He's a quick goalie. He's six four. And he's a boring goalie. Like, you know, he there's not, like, any, like, Patrick Waugh or Dominic Kasich, like, saves in him. You know, it's very regimented and, you know, like, I have to be here to make this save. And, like, it's all about making percentages and all that. So, you know, he's a boring goalie, but he could be a good one. So, because of his size. So that's why, you know, it, it. I probably wouldn't take him at 54, but that's likely right around where he's going to go. I don't think the Flames are at a point where they need to take a goalie high. I think they've got Ordeo, they've got uh, Olivier Waugh or Roy. They've got a lot of goalies who are going to be good enough for what they need for the next handful of years. I think if he's not you know, the goalie that we think we need, we can pass over him and see what's available either later or next year. Yeah, and there are quite a few decent prospects that, like, you could probably get in, like, the 6th or 7th round. But, yeah. Uh, so probably not a guy we'll see the Flames draft, but a possibility and a guy who will probably go right around there. The last guy on the list uh, for 54th overall that you've identified is Vakov Karabak. Uh, left winger, who played for Gatineau of the QMJHL. He had 47 points in the regular season, 21 goals, 26 assists, and 12 points in the playoffs. He's ranked 41st overall on, this, on the central scouting list. 
He is a bit smaller, which might make him not picked by this team if we're building a Brian Burke type team. He's 5'11, 185 pounds. What do we need to know about this player? Yeah, he is blazingly fast, and he plays with Poirier. So between the two, you know, I actually I do believe they're line mates in Gatineau. So, you know, he has some good offensive skill, like he has good hands, but it's mainly the speed that interests me because, like, he can pretty much keep up with a guy like Poirier. So, you know... The size is an issue. Like, if he was 6'1", like, that'd be a lot better. It, he's also a left winger, and between Berchi and Gaudreau, we do have a lot of smaller wingers. For a late second-round pick, possible third-round pick, he's a very good potential guy, you know, for if you're looking for a forward at that spot, so... Just depends, like everything. So, so, of those players that we talked about, you have identified two forwards. We have uh, Karabak and Magyar. Who would you take if you're looking for a forward? Oh, and uh, Brett Pollock as well. So, a right wing, a center, and a left wing. If you are the Flames and you're saying we want to take a forward here, which of those forwards would you take? Magyar, without question. So, pro- so you would pass over Karabak? Yeah. Probably Magyar and then Pollock? Yeah, but Pollock would be third, just because he, okay. it, Karabasek at least has the speed going for him, where Pollock's not, he's above average, but not quick quick, so, you know. Okay. It, like, it, when it comes to the later rounds, like, I look for something that stands out as, like, clearly above average, and, like, Karabasek's speed is like top notch he's probably one of the top four or five fastest players in the draft if not top three so you know like that could be an asset so you know it but i would go with magyar just because his overall package is a lot better and more rounded than karabachek or pollock so so for a for a second round pick, you're kind of looking for the player who you think has the better game right now, not necessarily the guy who might mature into the better forward, or if he was given a lot more time. Well, it, how would you say if you got a player like say player A has a good toolbox versus you know uh, player B who has like one or two good tools. Like, I'd take the guy that has the more tools, because, like, everybody, it, developing, it's not an exact science, so, like, you try to mitigate the risk, and so, like, if, say, like, player A has, like, five different assets to him, where player B only has, like, two you're more likely, player A is more likely to develop into something, even if the potential isn't quite as high. Okay. So you're you're looking for the more well-rounded player. Actually not really. I'm looking for the better player. Not you know, it it's kind of backwards cuz you know, like Magyar is the most skilled of the forwards. Like, he has more offensive tools at his disposal, where, like, Karabasek, he's just quick with decent hands. So, you know, where Magyar's got a good shot, good passing ability, good offensive instincts, this, that, you know, good size. So, you know. Because, I mean, it could be argued that the better player could be the one who has the best shot. And as, you know, a forward, that could be what makes the best player. So, Yeah, it, I'm just trying to find, like, anybody that stands out at, to me as being, like, the best player of the this bunch. And, okay. you know, Magyar, for me, for that group of six players would be the best forward. So. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. 
So if we move on to the third round then, the next pick the Flames have is 64th overall, which will be the fourth pick in the third round. And for this pick, you identified the same five guys or the same six guys that we just talked about. Why do you think those same six guys are who the Flames should be or would be targeting in the third round and that they'd even still be available 10 picks later? Well, it's one of those things that because uh, some teams go off the board and or like they'll pick European players randomly that are, you know, like they think they've found gold when, you know, likely they haven't. You know, those the guys that are like those six names, they're all in that 45 to 65 range and you know, they could slide, they could all be gone by 55, but you know, if it it's so hard to peg exactly where these players are gonna go, but you know these are some very talented players. So like it, it put it this way, if any of those six was available at sixty four, I'd probably go ahead and pick them, even if positionally they weren't the right guy like say like Mason McDonald we don't really need another goalie but you know he is a good goalie so maybe like if he is at 64 you go that route instead yeah well I think by 64 you're taking best player available yeah most potential yeah and if that if a guy that high does fall that low then yeah you would be taking them as probably the best player available I think by 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 the sixtieth pick, I think you throw positional depth out the window, or you're gonna get some really low end talent. Exactly. So you know you're more or less just shooting for tools at that point, and like who do you think will project upwards? You know, like say like Kanzig last year. You know, like you look at him, he's six seven, two fifty. And, you know, like, if he can learn how to skate, you have a beast of a defenseman. So, you know, and that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. Or, like, say, like, uh, getting Lance Boma or Max Reinhardt in years gone by. Like, do they have projectable NHL skills there? Well, let's uh, let's move on then to the other pick in the, the third round that the Flames have. The Flames acquired the 83rd overall pick from Pittsburgh when we traded Lee Stempniak away. And that's a pick in which you've identified four players you think the Flames might take. One defenseman, one goaltender, and two right-wingers. And let's start out with the defenseman, just because you've mentioned how the defense at this uh, stage of the draft you think are better than the forwards by and large. And the first defenseman you pegged here was Brandon Brandon Hickey, who played in the AJHL, actually. So lower leagues, um, sometimes it's harder to tell a guy who's playing at those kind of lower leagues where he's going to progress to. But he has 16 points, uh, 4 goals, 12 assists. He's 6'2", 181. What makes Brandon Hickey special? Well, he's somewhat similar in that, uh, like Jankowski, where he was playing at a really inferior level. But... With Hickey, he was also part of Team Canada's national teams at a couple of events. So that usually means that you've got somebody that has some skill there, even though he is playing at a lower level. And similar to Jacobs and Glover, he's going to be going to the NCAA and it'll likely be a four-year project. He has decent offensive skill. Defensively, he's all right. Has good mobility. You know, uh, lots of tools there. It, it's just you got to let them grow over time. And, like, the NCAA is the perfect place for him because he needs the time to mature. He's a very raw defenseman. Yeah, it's really weird to see players from the Alberta Junior League even get ranked by Central Scouting, and especially this high. So as much as he probably has some issues with his game, there's got to be something there about this kid that would make him project so highly. Well, 
only, I think, seven or eight players in total were ranked at all out of, like, the 200 and change players that, uh, from, like, the various Canadian minor, like, junior A leagues or whatever. So, you know, he's in exclusive company there in and of itself, because, you know, there's only eight, I think it was, so, you know. And he was by far the highest ranked of any of the eight as well. Like, all the others were, like, 160, 170 guys. Which so. is what you'd expect from a, an AJHL player. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's potential there. It, it, he is an extremely raw defenseman, though. Like, he'll probably take all four years and then probably a year in the AHL or two to figure it out. But, you know... Well, by the 83rd pick, that's what I expect. Yeah, exactly. And if he, put it this way, if he becomes an NHL defenseman, it's like found money <laughs> at that rate. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, and as we've talked about in the past, I'm a believer that not everybody has to make the NHL. I mean, you need some guys who, you know, round out the AHL depth. And by 83, I think that's about what you're looking for is the guy who's going to be a solid AHL player might get called up from time to time for injury. But, you know, I'm not expecting a top seven defenseman with the 83rd overall pick. Exactly. Anything above, like, a depth guy is a bonus at that rate. So... Yeah, for sure. Um, next player you had on the list, another goaltender. Uh, sixth on the Central Scouting North American goaltender list is Brian Halverson, who played for Sault Ste. Marie of the OHL last year. He's 6'4", 179, so a tall goaltender. Um, what do you think of Halverson? Uh, he is my dark horse in the draft for North American goaltenders. Uh, he's got very good footwork for a goaltender, and... He is, the one area that he has a problem with is he tends to overcommit when he's sliding across, but that's fixable, but, you Yeah, know, that's something that can be coached. Yeah, but he, he's also the backup in Sault Ste. Marie, so, you know, like, if, like, next year he should be the starter, so... You know, as he's getting more repetition, he'll things like the overcommitting should get fixed by that. But you got a six foot four goaltender that's very quick on his feet and has a decent blocker and a decent glove. Like you know, it's one of those things you're looking for individual tools with goaltenders. And for me, what I've found is that goaltenders that have good footwork tend to have a better likelihood of becoming NHL goaltenders just because it's hard to learn that. So more so than a blocker or a glove or sliding across a little too far. But, you know, Halverson seems to have a lot of all the tools that you need, like the height, the glove, the blocker, the footwork. It's just that he's a backup so, you know, as he gets more opportunity, he should grow and be a good one. So, And if you look historically, the Flames tend to pick a goaltender about this position in the draft. And we've had a lot of goaltenders in the system that are picked at about this spot that have lasted on this team for a long time. And I think right now, where, where the Flames are, they don't need a goaltender that can step in right away. I mean, we've got two or three already in our system, so maybe he could be taken there and be a long-term project as they work to fix some of those holes. Yeah, and, you know, when you got somebody that has a lot of the tools in place, it cuts on the things that you have to teach. <laughs> And, like, you can't teach size. And when you got somebody that's six foot four, like, if you can teach him the areas that he's deficient in, like, you got a monster in net. So, you know, and that would be very good. <laughs> so, you know. It would be. And he's a big goaltender, too. And I think we're seeing a trend in the NHL as a six foot four goaltender. We're seeing a trend towards bigger goaltenders. Yeah. The Brian so Bishop that could be helpful. type guys. Exactly. Or Ben Bishop, not Brian. 
The next guy on your list here is um, a player who has played overseas. He played for the U20 uh, team in Switzerland, Sweden. Sweden, I think. You hold Lamico. He's a six foot two, one hundred ninety pound right winger. So tell us what we need to know about Lamico. Well, he's a bigger right winger, and he's quick for his size. And offensively, he's not stellar, but he's just the notch down from that. He played in the same level that Marcus Granlin played uh, what the year that he was drafted, and he only had like 10 points less than Granlin did. And Granlin obviously was a second round pick, so, you know, if you're getting somebody like that in the third round, he might have enough offensive talent if you can combine that with his size and his speed to be... A notable prospect, possibly. Now, he's ranked 14th overall by Central Scouting for European skaters. What makes you think that he's going to fall far enough that we could take him with a pick in the in the low 80s? Uh, usually, European skaters, uh, once you get past, like, the 8 to 10 mark, it starts uh being a question of not when but if they'll get drafted so the fact he's at 14 he might even slide to the fourth or fifth round it's just that because we don't have a fourth or fifth round pick that i figured that you you take him early yeah ideally like if you were you had your heart set on lamico you might see if you couldn't trade down a bit with somebody that really wants 83 for like a fourth and a fifth or something. But, you know, at this rate, like you're just trying to find somebody that you might be able to mold into an NHL player. (laughs) So, you know, and if you got somebody that's big and has some offensive talent and is quick, that guy should it, like it, if you can teach them to play defensive, worst case scenario is you have a fourth liner that you know can play. <laughs> so you know it. It's difficult to project exactly, but he does seem to have some offensive skill, plus the speed and the size. Enough of a gamble there to see if you can mold him into something useful. And I think at this point in the draft, this is when you start taking gambles. I wouldn't start gambling much earlier than this. But especially with the picks the Flames have left, this is really their second last pick in the draft as they sit now. you got to start taking those gambles and getting the guys that you want because you're out for the next couple rounds. You don't have a pick. Yeah, exactly. Um, The last player that you've identified in this group He's another right winger, so it seems like you're starting to pull some of the forwards back in here, even though you, you'd mentioned earlier the forward group isn't as strong at this point. Uh, played in the OHL, 36 points overall. That's uh, 25 goals, 11 assists. Right, yeah. And this is right winger Darby Llewellyn. He's 6'1", 176 pounds. Um, I've seen some video of this guy. This is one of the few at this level I've seen. He looks like a good goal scorer. What's your intel on this guy? Well, uh, like Nick Magyar, uh, he's actually plays for the Kitchener Rangers as well. So finding another guy, possible gem in the garbage bin of the OHL. um, He did have 25 goals this year, which was tops on Kitchener. And I look at... uh, Jankowski and his situation in Providence and where he had more goals this year than assists and that was mainly due to the fact that his line mates sucked and (laughs) you know like he'd make a pass but they couldn't finish it well you can't punish the guy for necessarily for the the guy he's passing to not to be able to put it in so you know I'm thinking that maybe possibly because the 
Kitchener Rangers are such a crap team that maybe Llewellyn is a decent player, he's just got nobody to play with. And so he can put the puck in without much difficulty, but, you know, he passes it across to somebody and, you know, who doesn't know what end of the stick is up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, again, it's a gamble, but, you know, the possible upside is you might get a good scorer out of the deal, so... And I think at this point in the draft, as we said in the last player, it's worth taking the gamble um, if you're where the Flames are sitting with no, really no more picks until the sixth round. Yeah, and he's not slow. He's fairly decent, you know, a slightly above average speed. Seems relatively competent in the offensive zone positionally where he needs to go. So, you know, if you're going to gamble that's the type of guy that you would gamble on. At the 83rd pick, you've identified Hickey, Halverson, Lamico, and this player that we just spoke about. Which of those four, if you were the Flames picking at 83rd, would you take with that pick? I'd go with the defensive project Brandon Hickey of the four. Yeah? And why do you think Hickey's the right guy for that? Uh, Possible upside. I think he has the highest, like, Halverson probably has the highest upside of the four, but Hickey is less risky than the goaltender. <laughs> but, uh, plus Halverson might slide to number six, so who knows. But, um, the fact that we need defense and that Hickey does seem to have some upside there, even though he is a four-year project, you know, we need to restock our system for defensemen especially, so, you know, I wouldn't be displeased if the Flames went defense, 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 defense in the second and third round. Took all defensemen. Yeah. Except for the first round pick, which we don't think uh, they'll be taking a defenseman. Exactly. That sounds very reasonable. I mean, somebody's got to, you know, there's always an old adage, don't draft defensemen, and somebody has to draft them. So I think it's, yeah, with the defensemen being the group of players that seem stronger at this point, because you said the forwards really aren't that strong and don't differentiate themselves enough from each other, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, yeah, at this point, grab a defenseman. Yeah. And it's one of those things, like, if one of the really good forwards happens to slide, then by all means, go nuts. Take the the, the forward, but... Well, that's always true of any player. I mean, if someone slides down far enough, you have to take them. Yeah, but the thing is, is that from uh, around 25 in the rankings to 65, there's about 15 good defensemen there. And, you know, that's not necessarily, like, you might be able to get one of those good defensemen even at 83 just for the randomness of the draft from players, people taking overage guys or random Europeans and that. So, you know, it depends, but there stands a good chance that we could get three or four of these 15 or so good defensemen if we're lucky. So, you know, can't hurt. It sounds like if you're a Flames fan watching rounds two and three and what goes on there is going to be an uh, interesting watch and an interesting view of what's going to happen because, yeah, there's a lot. There's always a lot of uncertainty there. So I think we'll all keep our eyes peeled to what's going to go on with those two rounds. And, Matt, I think we'll wrap it up for this episode, and the next episode we'll come back and talk about uh, rounds four, five, six, and seven. Have a good one, everyone. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.